Wikipedia.com. Okay, everything's working. All right, I'll start off with a little intro. Well, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another edition of the Frankie Slauson Show. Uh, it's actually a special edition right now because, uh, believe it or not, you'll never guess who I have the chance of interviewing right now. Other uh, than the legendary Greg the Hammer Valentine has agreed to let me ask him a couple questions or a few questions here and there, and uh, I hope uh, hope I do a good job. Anyway, thanks for letting me interview you. Oh, you're welcome. You're welcome. And uh, a lot of these questions I'm going to ask are, are, I don't know, hopefully not too personal, you know, stuff that, you know, has been uh, about your career or whatnot as a wrestler, and uh, I hope it matches your approval. All right. Sure. Okay. First question, and hopefully it's all right. What is, or what was it like growing up, and explain growing up in wrestling? Well, um... I guess it's uh, it was it was it was a situation where you didn't see your dad too often if he was a pro wrestler because he traveled. And back in those days, uh, I think they uh, I think he was gone more than than I was from my family because he drove a lot, and uh, that was before all the flights and stuff we had to take. But he was gone a whole lot. And uh, but but being but being um, uh, Johnny Valentine's son was uh, was an experience, and uh, you know it was uh, you know you even you know I knew he was my dad and everything like that, but you have kind of a a hero worship for him too. But to tell the truth, I never wanted to be a wrestler at that early age. I never really realized I wanted to be a wrestler until. Uh, age 19 when I went on the road with him. Okay. And uh, was he was he kind of like your inspiration towards wrestling, kind of? Yeah, absolutely, because I watched wrestling, and, and um, where I grew up around Portland, Oregon, the wrestling that I saw was pitiful. There was a couple of guys that were okay, but uh, it was basically, you know, you could tell it was just a bunch of BS. I didn't like it, and uh, but I would see my father wrestle, and I'd see his uh, matches uh, come over from New York or L.A. or some of the bigger cities and come into our area, and uh, I would see a difference. Uh, uh, it was a lot more realistic. Okay. Did you, uh, before you thought of the idea of wrestling, was there ever a possibility that you uh uh, take up a college at all before you started wrestling or well I was going to college I'd already done a year at lower Columbia College and um, in in uh, just north of Portland Oregon and um, I basically uh, went on the road that summer after my first year in college that summer and uh, I was uh, on the road with my dad in Texas. He was a Texas heavyweight champion for three months, and they were, it was a blast. And after I watched him perform, and he was undoubtedly, and I'm not saying it just because I was his son, I'm not prejudiced. I'm saying it because it's truth. It's true that Johnny Valentine was the greatest wrestler I'd ever saw. And when I watched him for several times, uh, uh, some of the greatest matches I can really recall against Wahoo McDaniel, Fritz von Erich, Mill Mascaris, uh, in Houston, sellout crowds in Dallas, Houston, San Antonio, that whole circuit there. And uh, I was swept off my feet, and, and I, I realized that uh, I wanted to try it. Another question that I had... Uh uh, it was way back in your early days. You you wore a shirt that said I wore uh, I broke Wahoo McDaniel's uh, leg. Can you explain that? Well, actually, uh, it wasn't my idea to wear that. The promoter says, "Hey, I got a T-shirt for you." He says, "I, I want you to wear this," and I took uh, pictures with it and I wore it around. And I got a couple other ones, and it was just uh, it was braggadocious and and. Um, you know, I, I thought it was kind of silly, but you know what? Uh, the silliness really, really uh, 
got a lot of heat from me. The people hated that, and, and that's what the promoter wanted, and so I gave it to him. Sounds good. Uh, now, if you w will, it's explain uh, your early days. Uh, started with NWA, WWWF, or the Worldwide Wrestling Federation, for all you people who wonder what that meant. And then, of course, the WWF and WCW. Well, of course, I I wrestled uh, all over the place when I was a, well, in the early 70s. I jumped, mainly it was just NWA, and uh, jumped all over the place with them. Uh, uh, broke in my career up there with Stu Hart, Bret Hart's father. Everybody knows that by now. And, and uh, I started up there in Canada and Alberta, went down. He was part of the NWA. Then I went down and wrestled for the Sheik and actually lived at the Sheik's compound out there or ranch or whatever you want to call it for several months and uh, trained with him in Detroit. And he was also NWA too. And uh, later on, hooked up with Donnie Fargo, uh, became the Fargo Brothers. Uh, all this time, I was using different names, uh, never using my real name, which is Greg. Never used Greg Valentine um, until around 1973, when I thought I could uh, actually uh, uh, carry it. Everybody... Everybody realized and, and, and watched me and says, oh, you look like Johnny Valentine because I look very much like my dad. And uh, very, very much. But, um, uh, you know, after Fargo and I split up, and Fargo was, uh, was a very good trainer. He trained me a lot about the business. I went in 1974, went to the NWA uh, by recommendation of Jack Briscoe, who was a world champion, went down to Florida, and that's really where Greg Valentine had his birth. In Florida. Okay. Uh, how about, okay, your Vince McMahon and the WWF. How did that happen? Well, before we go that far, in Florida in 1974, did very, very well down there, and, and uh, it was a great place to learn wrestling Florida's championship wrestling which was owned by Eddie Graham and they did really really wrestling it wasn't BS wrestling it wasn't pulling hair poking eyes gimmicks uh, pulled out of the pants and chairs and tables it was wrestling and, uh, and, and they had real good rules strict rules it was great great wrestling territory uh, George Scott who was a booker in uh, for the NWA up in Charlotte, North Carolina, Mid-Atlantic Championship Wrestling. My dad had suffered a plane crash in 1975, and he was crippled from the waist down. And he was basically what was holding that whole territory together. He was he was the main star up there, Johnny Valentine, Mid-Atlantic, made it what it was at that time. And he kept calling me and calling me and calling me and telling me to come up. And I'm really realizing that uh, these are some real big shoes I've got to fill, and I didn't think I was ready for it. And um, but he kept calling and calling. So 1976, I went up to Greensboro Coliseum and wrestled up there with a sellout crowd, which I guess is about 18, 19,000 people, and that was the biggest show in the Carolinas, Greensboro Coliseum. I wrestled Johnny Weaver, and that was Johnny Weaver's last match. They set it up to where I was the guy that ended his career, and he had a big-time career in the Carolinas, Johnny Weaver. I dropped the elbow off the second rope across his throat, and they carried him out, and that was it. After that, they started bringing me in, in and out, in and out. Eventually, they tagged me up with Ric Flair, and uh, we took off and uh, became the world champions. And... I stayed there. It was a great area for me. And 1979, we got a call from Vince McMahon down in, in Carolinas. And the, uh, George Scott's idea was to, to get me out of the Carolinas for a while and go up to New York because they really needed, they needed a heel. They needed something new up there. The business wasn't really good up there. And so 1979 is when I... It was January 1979 when I first came up uh, to uh, New York and uh, started doing uh, the tapings over in Allentown, Pennsylvania. Was this now Vince McMahon Jr. or Vince McMahon Sr.? Senior. Senior. Okay. Uh, how did uh, 
the connection with uh, Vince McMahon Jr. Like, was this like after his dad had you uh, be in the wrestling or WWF? Or, or well, I I came up came up in 1979. Vince McMahon Sr. was running everything. Uh, Vincent Mann's junior or whatever his name is, they, he's not really a junior. He's just Vincent Mann. He um, he was a uh, the, the TV announcer and he and he just helped his dad out. And uh, so his dad ran everything. I came in there. They they uh, put me over with a figure four leg lock. I was breaking guys' legs. Uh, they were carrying them out as fast as I could wrestle them. And they were building me up for Bob Backlund who was the world champion at the time. And uh, the first time I ever wrestled, actually, that wasn't on television, my first main event in New York, in the territory there was Madison Square Garden against Bob Backlund. There was a big snowstorm, but the place was still sold out. And I wrestled Bob, and we went one hour to the time limit, so it was a tie. It was a no contest. One hour with Bob Backlund, let me tell you, that wasn't easy because Bob Backlund was a great NCAA champion. He, uh, I never thought he was the greatest pro wrestler because he didn't really have all the brass, matazz, and the showbiz, but he was a great man. He's a great wrestler, and I took my time with him, and I was one of the few wrestlers that could have a real quality match with Bob Backlund. Okay. Uh, let's see. Uh now, as we move on here, in your great legendary career as a pro wrestler, uh, for those that are listening at home who that don't know much about you, how many uh, championships have you won total in your career? Well, I, you know, probably 30, 40. I don't know. I, I could sit down and, and count them out. But, yeah, there's a, there's a bunch of them. I mean, after I left... Uh, uh, New York in 1981, I went back to the Carolinas and uh, uh, went back there and wrestled while McDaniel broke his leg and, uh, you know, uh, became the United States champion down there. And then I went back to back to New York again and did a big feud with Pedro Morales where I suplexed him on a cement floor, went back, turned around and went back to the NWA in Charlotte again. And then I started that legendary feud with Roddy Piper, and that's where we finished off with a dog collar match on the very first pay-per-view, closed circuit ever in 1983. This is before the first WrestleMania or anything. It was Roddy Piper, dog collar match against Greg the Hammer Valentine for the U.S. belt. He beat me because that was his kind of match, but I still retained the title. Uh, eventually, though, we both left, uh, and we both ended up and winded up and started our career in uh, the late, late 19, well, actually it was 84, yeah, 84, we came into uh, uh, New York. Okay. Uh, let's see. Uh, that dog collar match, wasn't that uh, from Starcade, like the first Starcade paper? Yeah, it's all the Vince, of course, brought up, bought up all the uh, uh, the tapes and everything from the Mid Atlantic, and uh, he's got it out on a DVD set right now, and uh, it's a tremendous match. If you ever get a chance to watch any of the people listening to the radio, if they ever get a chance to go out and pick up the greatest 15 stars of the 80s, I believe that's what it's called, and and yeah, and it's it's. Uh, it's a phenomenal match I have in there with Tito, an Indian strap match, and also uh, that dog collar match, which which was, uh, you know, that was, uh, even before that was out on DVD, people would stop me in the airports and all over the place because I still do a lot of traveling, and they, they would always mention that match. So a pretty brutal match, a pretty good match, a classic in your uh in your memory of great matches that you've had. Uh, now, now going back to your way before you started, we're kind of switching guns here, uh, way before you started being a pro wrestler, uh, when you first started, how brutal was the training? Uh, well, you know, I was a young kid, and uh, I was in good shape, and I had good genes because, after all, I was Johnny Valentine's son. But I... I I tested myself. I worked really, really hard with the weights, 
and I uh, not only weight training, but I did some boxing training where not actually boxing uh, an individual, but uh, working out on the bag because my dad wanted me to, to learn how to throw a punch real good. So I did a lot of that, and I uh, did running. I you know I hated to run because heavier guys, it's hard harder on your knees and your ankles. So I, f- I found out when I first time I went to Japan, that uh, you didn't have to run the the same thing you could do is you could do free squats and just do these uh, like sumo squats and stuff. So I started doing that. Okay. Okay. And I already asked you that question. In your career, how many like uh, we already talked about the dog collar match being a favorite of yours. Uh, any other favorite matches? Uh, well, I had a lot of favorite matches. Uh, actually. Um, one of those, one of my favorite matches. It's a great match for me to to watch and see. Is, is on that double DVD set. Uh, the greatest matches of the '80s or superstars of the '80s was Tito, which was a lumberjack match. That was that was one of my favorites too. Okay, all-time favorites. Uh, let's see. Now this is a, a, a recent event that I I, I looked up and then I kind of realized or remembered from last October, I remember seeing you on WWE Raw's uh, homecoming to the USA Network on October 3rd, 2005 in Dallas, Texas. Explain what it felt like to be back in a WWE ring with all your favorite, or were with all your fellow legends like Hacksaw, Jim Duggan, Jimmy Snuka, and much more. You know, that was all fine and dandy, but I wish they would have let me wrestle somebody, you know. Um, Standing around in a ring is one thing, and but I actually, you know, I, I would have been thrilled if they would have just brought me back and let me wrestle somebody. And how how would have that been able to, or how would have you been able to do that? Would you have been able to ask Vince if you could have done a match, or or how does that work? When he brought me back for the Hall of Fame, put me in the Hall of Fame, I said, well, let, let me have a match. Oh no 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 no. You know, but, but uh, his old ass can get out there at 60 years old and wrestle if he wants to. And, uh, uh, you know, I, I wanted to wrestle because that's that's what I am. I, you know, I'm a pretty good talker. I'm a, you know, whatever, you know, I can do other things besides wrestling. But wrestling is what I am, and that's what I'm about. And, uh, and standing out in the ring with my clothes on, waving at people, that's not Greg Valentine. I like to get out there and wrestle. Well, after after you were inducted to the Hall of Fame, and I'll ask you about that here a little bit. Uh, one question I had to ask was uh, after the uh, I noticed after the uh, homecoming, uh, Vince actually did let you wrestle a few matches on uh, a few Sunday Night Heat tapes. Yeah, and actually I was supposed to be on Raw, and uh, they ended up changing it at the last minute and put me on the Heat, which which uh, plays in Europe on television, but unfortunately it, it only plays on on the Internet over here. And uh, and I was supposed to be on Raw, so then they said they were going to bring me back for some other things, and I'm still waiting for that call. And I hope you get that call, because it will be nice to see you back at the WWE ring again. Uh, let's see. And now, of course, uh, as I was mentioning earlier, uh, Here's a question that you've probably been asked a million times and explain what and how it felt to be inducted into the WWE Hall of Fame back on Saturday, March 30, March 13, 2004, a day prior to WrestleMania 20. Well, I've been calling Vince several times between, uh, oh, I don't know, over the 10 years that lapsed between 1994 when I, I did a Royal Rumble and I did something else. I did a couple matches. And... And uh, I didn't return to any WWE rings for quite a long time. I've I've been very successful independent-wise, though, and did a lot of a lot of good things independent and made a made a good living at it. But in, when I got the call from Vince, I was in Phoenix at a uh, conference. Actually, it was a conference for uh, Christian athletes, and I'm, I was out there. And all of a sudden, I get a call, and it came in private. I said, I don't know if I should answer this or not, but I answered it, and it was Vince McMahon. And I said, oh, you're returning my call. Um, you know, I thought maybe he was returning my call because he wanted me to come up and wrestle because that's what I wanted to do. Yeah. 
But he says, no, we're going to do WrestleMania 20. We want to induct you into the Hall of Fame. And uh, that was a surprise. Um, the only other time I had seen Vince was like four or five months before that at Road Warrior Hawk's funeral in Tampa, Florida, and uh, right, right close to where I live, and I was a good friends with Hawk, and I saw Vince there, and he was very, very friendly to me, and so I think maybe that connection, and the fact he wanted to start up the Hall of Fame because he really hadn't inducted anybody for a while, and uh, so that was that 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 made me feel really good, yeah. And it was uh, seeing well, this is actually before they allowed. Uh, they just recently started allowing uh, people on USA Network or Spike TV, or let's just see the 20 uh, Resume 21. They had uh, on Spike TV the Hall of Fame last year, and then this year they had on the USA Network. Uh, they did have a, a disc out uh, on the Hall of Fame, uh, and you remember that. Uh, any uh, any matches on that? Any uh, bonus features uh, as far as you go? Yeah, there's a, that's a very good disc, by the way. That's a 2004 induction uh, Hall of Fame. And uh, it's got great interviews uh, with me and my part, the people that were inducted with me, like Tito and all the other guys, Jesse Ventura and stuff. But there is a, there's a match on there, uh, which was a classic match uh, where I lost my title but it was still a great match. It was uh, out of Baltimore, and it was um, uh, a steel cage match, Tito against myself from 1985, and uh, fabulous match. That's on that DVD. Okay. Uh, let's see. Uh, I, I went to your website because I know you got a website out or whatever, and uh, I understand that you're coming up with a book, and if that's true... If it is, what can fans expect out of it, and when will it be, or when will the release date be? Well, I tell you what, uh, the book uh, I'm still working on, it, and it's it's a lot. It's it's a big undertaking for me because I started in 1970, and I'm 50 some years old now, and and I've been I'm still wrestling right now. I'm still in the business. I'm not sitting around selling cars or being a disc jockey somewhere or something. I'm still in the business, and I've got a lot to say. And I started my book, and I've got a, you know, I, I use a tape recorder, basically like we're using right now, and uh, but not that big. But I, I go around and, and record things as I remember them. And uh, there is so much that, that uh, I'm having trouble condensing and chopping it up I'm also having a problem with uh, there's there's certain things I want to say, but I don't know if I should say them or not because w once you put it on paper for the public to see and everything. But I really, you know, I don't want a book that's censored by the WWE, censored by Vince McMahon. I want to come out with a book, not necessarily a uh, tell-all book like Jose Canseco or anything like that, but. Original. Something more original, and 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 tell them more about uh, instead of just road stories and wrestling stories. Give them a little insight of of my life, like how it was to go back to sit in a hotel room after being in front of ninety some thousand people, and you know just so so I'm still working on it. I'm not sure if I'll even have the darn thing done this year, but I hope so. But I want to, when it comes out, I want it to be the right, the right deal, you know. Yeah, and, that, and that's very true because a lot of wrestlers, uh, not say anything bad about a lot of the other wrestlers, but they, you know, it's, it's like you know when you have somebody else write your stuff for you or whatever, their stories, their true stories, but they're not, they don't put as much heart into them as as to what you plan on doing. I take it. Yeah, and I've got a good guy, uh, Evans, his name, and he lives in Brooklyn, New York, and. He's a school teacher and he's written books and and uh, he's basically gonna go uh, hand walk me right through it when he gets all the tapes and uh, we're gonna you know I I want to have a good good book and uh, I'm not gonna drop names and stuff like that or hurt anybody but I want it I want it to be a real special book I want it to be one of the best out there. Okay, well that sounds great. I, I hope. Uh, well, it does re get released that uh, get a chance to take a look at it. And, uh, 
Hey, let's see. Uh, well, talk about your book and whatnot. Uh, here's an idea that I have for you. Maybe you've thought about this, you know, in your career or even now that you're. Uh, yeah, I mean, you're still in the career, you're still in the business, but now that you you have your your glory days, you know. Uh, I was thinking that you should talk to Vince McMahon and come up with a uh, kind of like a tribute DVD set of all your famous matches and, and whatnot, and kind of like what you're doing for your book, because as you know, the WWE owns rights to over what was it, about 75,000 hours of WWE program that combines everything that has been produced by WWE, WCW, ECW, Jim Crockett Promotions, NWA, all that stuff, and. I'm sure if you could work out some, or if you would work out some, uh, you could probably come up with a two or three disc DVD, or maybe even a four disc like Hogan. And uh, what do you think about that? Well, I know that uh, some of the guys have their own disc. Jake the Snake Roberts, uh, some some other guys, uh, and uh, I'm surprised they haven't called me because I'm virtually on. I'm all, I'm like on 20 years of. I was there for 16 years and off and on for 20 years, but 16 straight through. And that's that's a long time, and that's a lot of tapes. That's a lot of stuff. And, um, you know, I thought I would have got a call already to to do it. And uh, I hear that they're, they're doing one about Roddy Piper. Uh, he's coming out with one. So, um, you know, trying to get to Vince and trying to talk to him is like pulling teeth. Uh, you always got to go through all everybody else, and then somebody else calls you back. But uh, you know that's a great idea, and um, uh, I would like to I would like to to have him put it because there's plenty. Of, I mean, people, a lot of people get this 24/7 channel, yeah, and here. yeah, but certain states do, and uh, they say they see me all the time on there. You know, so. Um, but uh, that's a good idea, and so I'll pursue that. Well, yeah, it's just something to think about because, uh, and uh, we'll talk about your, your career and whatnot, uh, and most of the DVD compilations that Vince uh, brings out, you're basically on just about all the uh, uh, DVD compilations anyway, so why don't they just put together a whole collection of stuff, uh, even stuff maybe from house shows. I don't know if they tape house shows anymore. I don't really know what the circuit is on that, but uh, just great memories and whatnot and that people will love and cherish. And here's another question that I have for you. Uh, of course, it has to do with wrestling of yesterday compared to wrestling today. What are your thoughts on that? Well, wrestling today could be just as darn good or better than wrestling from my era because the guys are bigger, they're more, I think they're more athletic and everything, but, you know, I was watching a, you know, watching a match, I, I didn't even know it was on, I was over at my friend's house, and it was Saturday night's main event, a couple, couple weeks, I guess it was last Saturday, I didn't even know it was on, and um, so I said, hey, that's great, you know, and they were showing little clips, I thought I saw myself on one of the clips, and, because I was, you know, we started that thing, and, uh, it's very good for wrestling, and it's on mainstream NBC network, so it's fabulous. So I'm watching a six-man tag, and I'm 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 watching the wrestling, and it, and I'm you know I'm you know I'm like hey yeah 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 this is good you know this is good wrestling. All of a sudden a midget jumps out from underneath the ring, and hits a guy with a ball bat, and I go there you go there you go a bunch of more crap that they have to put in the mix to make it, instead of making it look like a legitimate sport, which I always uh, always told everybody I was a real wrestler, and I, and I am. And when they, when they throw crap like that in there, it's like throwing a wrench right into everything, and I go, there we go again. You got nice, serious wrestling going on, and a midget comes out with a baseball bat. <laughs> yeah. so, uh, but back to, your, to answer your question, wrestling could be or it could be better because, yeah. you know, every generation is better. Yeah. And uh, athletes, people bigger, you know, healthier, people yeah. living longer. But you know what? It's not better. It's better in, in the era that I came from, the 70s and the 80s. And uh, going back to Saturday night's main event, yeah, with Batista finally coming back uh, on uh, SmackDown and whatnot, he was supposed to take on Mark Henry this Sunday at the 
Great American Bash, but uh, he's unfortunately injured. Now he'll take on Ken Kennedy. He, at got, the, in, he got injured again? Mark Henry? Well, Mark Henry got injured, and then uh, he got injured during that six-man tag. Oh, okay. I don't remember who he got injured by, but he uh, he did get injured. That Now uh, that's going to change for tomorrow night's uh, Great American Bash pay-per-view. It's going to be uh, Ken Kennedy facing Batista. I don't know if you follow SmackDown at all, but uh, I'm more of a Raw guy myself, but I, I don't know. Just because SmackDown's taped and whatnot, and right. Raw is live, you get more of that feeling when it's live. Uh, okay, and... Uh, not to take up too much more of your time. Uh, once again, I want to say thank you for letting me uh, interview you. It's really a thrill to finally uh, meet uh, someone who I've idolized for a long time. And, you know, this is a dream come true for me, you know. I appreciate it. Yeah, no problem. Uh, last but certainly not least, I got a two-part question for you. Uh, and, and I said if I ever get had the chance to ever meet you, this is what I would ask. First question. How was life on the road with the Hockey Talk Man and Jimmy Hart when you guys were known as the duo Rhythm and Blues? You want the truth or a lie? Well, whatever you want to give me. We're, we're, on, we're on Sensor Radio. What the heck? <laughs> okay. I liked Hockey. Uh, I liked him doing his own thing, and, uh, you know, I, I enjoyed him. He was funny. When I dyed my hair and everything, that was Vince McMahon's idea, and he chased me around for about nine months, and so finally I said, okay, what the hell, because I, I felt I felt that, that I was towards the end of my run at the WWF, because I'd been there 16 years now when this happened, so I did it, and, uh, but to answer your question about Honky Tonk and Jimmy Hart, it was depressing because uh, all these other times I was by myself. And then when you're in a tag team, it's like being married to somebody. And I didn't, my style of wrestling, I don't think fit Honky Tonk style of wrestling because I was much more solid. And I'm not saying I'm not knocking Honky, but it was depressing for me. Um, I didn't enjoy it. Uh, when I look back at it and see tapes and stuff, I laugh at it, and I go, well, it wasn't that bad. But at the time, for me, when the situation I was going through, and uh, I, I didn't enjoy myself too much. <laughs> Not even playing guitars or whatever? Or was that actually you guys playing guitars, or was that somebody else's? I don't know how to play guitar. I don't know how to play anything. All you know is how to do is wrestle. Love music. I love music, and... Uh, uh, but I, I'm a wrestler. Yeah. yeah. Not a musician. I don't think we'll see any uh, mu musical yeah. albums coming out uh, by Greg the Hammer Valentine with like Prince or, or Pearl Jam or whatever. Uh, okay. And and finally, the second half of the question that I have for you, uh, I'm gonna name a few wrestlers, ones who are still around and maybe some that have passed on. And uh, if you would, ex once I mentioned a, a wrestler, explain a memory or two about them. Okay. All right, sure. Okay. First one is, of course, legendary Kurt Henning. That's perfect. When I think about Kurt Henning, I think about him spitting his gum in his hand, throwing it up in the air and catching it in his mouth, and all those little perfect things he did. He was a great guy. And when I heard that uh, he died, I was in Phoenix at the time and heard that he had passed away, and he was in my hometown of Tampa. And... Uh, you know, I cried about it. Uh, he was a a great man. He had a great family. It was a accident that he, you know that uh, he uh, that he had there, and and it was a real shame. What a real waste. Yeah, no kidding. Because uh, he was just getting. Well, I guess you can't really say he was in the prime of his career, but uh, I remember the last time I ever saw him wrestle was uh, I watched a, a pay per view. Actually, this was like a TNA. Of course, I'm sure you've heard TNA, totally nonstop wrestling of, uh, by in Orlando, Florida. Anyway, before they went to Orlando, I remember watching. This is like around 2002, I believe, or 2003. Yeah, and he uh, faced Jeff Jarrett for the WWE or TNA Championship, and of course, they didn't win it. But uh, that was the last time I ever saw him wrestling. Even though I remember him. Uh, Wrestling at uh, making his WWE return in 2002 for the uh, Royal Rumble. Didn't use him good there either. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's a shame. It's a real shame. The guy was in terrific shape 
when he died, and he could have easily made a comeback. But it's just one of those things that uh, when Vince is done with it, he's done with it, you know. That's kind of sad. I mean, you don't normally hear wrestlers. You don't really hear wrestlers really say that on the TV. I suppose they can't, or or they or they would like to, but they just don't, or whatever. Okay, now here's here's a little positivity anyway for wrestler, Ric Flair. Uh, yeah, Ric Flair was always a good friend of mine, and he is a, a consummate professional. Uh, you can't say nothing bad about Rick, and. Uh, I haven't seen Rick on the, on the TV lately. I haven't been watching it. I guess they they beat him up pretty bad, and maybe he's getting ready to make a return. But uh, you know, my hats off to him. To uh, you know, I we we came up the same way. And uh, Johnny Valentine, my dad trained Rick. They were partners before me and Rick became partners before my dad had that plane crash. Rick was in that plane crash and survived it, and. Uh, Hats off to Rick, you know, um, I would love, I would love, to, and I've tried pitching it to the WWE to let me come in and wrestle Rick, who's the best old timer out there, you know, and uh, I think it would be a great match, and, um, well, I know it would, I don't think, I know, and uh, you're talking about a hundred years of experience there, <laughs> maybe not that many, well, but, you know, yeah. close, 60 or something. Yeah, he's he's a year older than I am, okay. and um, you know my hats off to Rick. He's a great, great professional. And we know one day he will be in the Hall of Fame, hopefully soon, even while he's still wrestling. As far as what you're asking about the uh, if he's returned to TV, he has returned a little bit. Uh, he's actually started a few now with uh, Mick Foley at uh, he faced Mick Foley in a two L T Falls match at Vengeance last month. Oh, okay. And, uh, they really don't like each other. <laughs> yeah, and I'm surprised Vince let them do that, but, uh, I, yeah, and, and I think now they're going to probably uh, have him face Mick F or Ric Flair again at, uh, face Mick Foley at SummerSlam, I believe. Well, Ric Flair said in his book that Mick Foley wasn't a good wrestler. <laughs> he was horrible. And, you know, it's basically Mick Foley had his own style. Nobody could fall off the cage backwards, uh, do the things that, that Mick Foley could do, but he couldn't do the things that Rick or myself could do in the ring. So he just devised a way that, that he could become a, a standout in another direction. You think Mick Foley is like a stunt man like what Rick Flair said? But I think Rick, Rick uh, should have uh, complimented Mick because Mick has done a lot of good things, and Mick's, Mick's a good guy. Yes, he is. Even though they have him as a bad guy right now, but I'm sure everyone knows it's just a storyline and whatnot. Okay, here, here's some uh, more wrestlers here. Uh, of course, the legendary Hulk Hogan. What, what can you say? Yeah, what can you say about Hulk Hogan? They were supposed to, they were trying to hook me up with Hulk Hogan. I, I, I will say that uh, a couple months ago. They wanted to bring Hogan back in and let him wrestle me, and um, but I don't know what happened to that, but uh, it didn't happen. Now Hogan is coming back. He's going to wrestle Randy Orton. I just did a Hogan's Knows Best, and it's going to be on television coming up, and uh, it's a bunch of wrestlers invade his house down there in Miami, and we all get... Uh, we all have a bunch of shots of tequila and <laughs> drink beer and wine and whiskey and everything, and we jump in the pool, and and it's a crazy deal. I, it's going to be airing on his new season. Good luck to Hawks. You can't – he's the top banana no matter what era you, you're going to talk about. He is number one and will always be number one. Okay. Uh of course, we all know he has that Hogan Knows Best TV show, as you imagine. We we do get the VH1 network over here. Thanks to Showberg's Cable for that. And uh, here's another wrestler, Terry Taylor, a.k.a. the Red Rooster. Terry Taylor's, uh, we were tag teams uh, together. In fact, we won the uh, United States Championship in WCW. A little short term for me, I got disgusted and left uh, because it has so many. When you have wrestlers running a a company. That's why WCW ended up being run right into the ground and Vince McMahon bought them out because you have wrestlers running a company and you've got a bunch of egos. you got to have owners that don't get into the ring and run it. And that's why Vince is still 
alive, and that's why his company is still doing good, because you don't have a wrestler in there running things. That's why WCW went, and at one time, in 97, I believe, because I came back, I came back to WCW in 97, and they were they were knocking uh, knocking uh, Vince out of the ratings war right there for a while, for 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 a while, yeah, and uh, and uh, but Terry Taylor, good partner, uh, he's a good man, uh, he's a great talker. I thought he was a great wrestler. He never really got to the heights that I thought he could have. You know, he was wasn't really one of the bigger guys. I'm not that much bigger than Terry Taylor either, but uh, uh, I think he's involved with uh, this TNA thing or something. I think he has something to do with that. But, uh, um, yeah, but uh, Terry's a good man. Okay. I, I recently seen him in a uh, Splenda commercial. I don't know. He, he did, like, a little deal for Splenda. He and his family. I don't know if you've seen that at all or whatever. Okay. Now talk about the Hart family, of course. I've already mentioned about that. Uh, you, you, know, you said you got trained by Stu Hart. Everyone knows that, I hope. Uh, talk about a couple of his sons, of course. Bret Hart first and Owen Hart second. Well, uh, uh, Bret Hart, um, unfortunately, uh, got hurt by Bill Goldberg and WCW, and he's never been the same since. And uh, he just kind of went into hiding. And then he had that wrestling with shadows on TV all the time. And... And that's all. That, that that's pretty close to the truth. Um, and uh, so Brett kind of just. Uh, it's it's good to see him come back. I was on one of his first shows that he came back, and and uh, uh, some of those wrestle reunion things he's come around for the independent uh, wrestle reunions and 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 uh, some. You know, they're basically autograph signings and wrestling matches, but Brett doesn't wrestle anymore. I don't think he ever could wrestle anymore because he had a slight stroke, and that was caused by falling off his bicycle. I don't know if it was a motorbike or just a bicycle, but uh, that all stemmed from the fact that he got piledrived on his head. And for, for people who doesn't think wrestling is real, that that was one real thing. And Goldberg was a, a little green and a little overzealous, and uh, it, <coughs> it happened. But uh, Brett, Brett is a good man. And Owen Hart, uh, uh, I didn't know Owen like I knew Brett, uh, but uh, the whole Hart family, everybody, uh, good kids. I mean, there's 12 of them with uh, Stu. 12, no, it was 12. They, they had uh, 25 cats, but they had 12 kids. And uh, <coughs> Stu was a good man, and he, he brought up a lot of, lot of good kids. And uh, Owen, um, unfortunate, that was a terrible thing that happened to Owen Hart. Yeah, and I, I don't know, you know, WWE still talks about once in a while, but... Uh, you know, it's kind of weird that they didn't get sued, uh, you know, be actually sued by the Hart family for this, you know, because... I think they did. Or, I think they did. Uh, I think they did get sued, but I... Uh, did they want some power or something? Yes, they, they want a lot of money. Yes, they did. Okay, uh, of course, recently we just found out that uh, Earthquake, John Tenta, passed away, which is kind of sad. Another great wrestler that's maybe not in his private career anymore, but... A guy who, you know, is still a legend and always will be. Uh, what are your thoughts on him, John Tenta? You know, I, I wrestled John Tenta on the last WrestleMania that I did, WrestleMania 7 in Los Angeles. And, um, you know, he, it wasn't one of my great matches. I, I wish they'd take the tape and throw it away. But uh, nevertheless, I was supposed to wrestle... Earthquake. Uh, Jimmy Hart was a manager who had turned his back on me, and and um, I was supposed to wrestle him for a, like about a 15-minute match, and and they cut it right down to like six or seven minutes, and and it and it really made me. I was I was almost ready to just walk out of the building because I it made it like a, a just an ordinary match. Uh, with with no hype, it wasn't like a WrestleMania match, and 
I was very disgusted with that. And it wasn't too long ago that, uh, too long after that, that, that I left WWE because I was so disgusted. Um, and it wasn't a, a good way to, to go out. And so, uh, you know, I, it, um, as far as John Tenton, I, I saw him and he was driving trucks. I saw him at a wrestling show in Georgia. He just stopped by and, uh, said hi to me and everything. I thought everything was fine with him. And he said he was starting to drive tractor trailers and, and the big guy, he looked like a truck driver. So I said, Hey, maybe this is your forte. So, and then a few months later, I heard that, uh, he had some kind of, uh, stomach cancer or something and he'd been fighting in a long time uh but uh he's one of the legends definitely okay uh a couple other wrestlers to mention real quick uh first uh ray trailer aka the big boss man i was with ray um in phoenix we were doing a show out there and we rode a long time in a car together and uh Two months later, I found out he had a heart attack. And we were just talking about Kurt Henning because he was a real good friend with Kurt Henning. And he was a real good friend with Rick Rude, who was another guy that, you know, ravishing Rick Rude. Another, two of his real good friends because they really hung out together. And I hung out with those guys too. But those three guys were inseparable on the road in the old WWF days. Yeah. And I says, Ray, how... What do you do? You, do you feel? What do you feel like when you think about both those guys being gone? He goes very, very sad. Two months later, Ray Trailer's gone, and he was one of the you know all these guys that keep saying are nice guys, yeah. but the, he he was one of the nicest. He was a real good man. Really have him as a bad guy, but he, deep down he was a he was a teddy bear kind of kind of okay, and. Uh, Another family that probably that you're really familiar with, and, and I hate to bring up people that are a lot no longer here, but you know it's nice to hear your thoughts on on these wrestlers, you know, because I'm sure other wrestlers will be talking about other wrestlers kind of like that too. Uh, the Von Eric family. All right, we're back. Sorry about that little interruption here. Had to had to quickly uh, change things around a little bit. But we're back, and we were talking about the uh, Von Erich family. Yeah, I, I first met the Von Erichs. Uh, of course, my dad was Texas Heavyweight Champion. Fritz Von Erich was really the promoter for Dallas, Fort Worth, Texas, and stuff. And saw all those kids when, when I was a kid, basically, too. They were... A little bit younger than me, and I think the first one that came out was David Von Erich, who who was a great wrestler, really good timing. In fact, he was one of the best. He was better than Kerry, although Kerry had the great body and everything. But David Von Erich was fantastic, and he died over in Japan complications. And then a couple of them that I really didn't know committed suicide and. And Kerry, of course, a uh, real sad thing where he committed suicide. There's still one left, Kevin Von Erich, who I wrestled just not too long ago on an independent show a couple years ago. And uh, I saw Kevin was at the Saturday night's main yeah. event the other night because they were in Dallas. And I understand that he he signed a, a little merchandising contract with him so that they're going to put all the Von Erichs out and make them into those WWE classic dolls. Okay. And, um, but, you know, what can you say? That's a tragic, tragedy, tr horrible thing that happened to the, that family. And there's only one guy standing, and that's Kevin. Pretty weird. It's pretty weird stuff. It's really sad to see well, he's great. I remember Bret Hart saying, you know, on just, I don't know if you've seen that recent DVD that he just came out with, The Best There Is, Best There Was, The Best There Ever Will Be. Yeah. I happened to own a copy of that, and I was watching the two-hour biography on him, and that the WWE produced, and they said that uh, it, it's sad when, when the great wrestlers who, you know, are like family to you just pass away like that, when unexpectedly 
because he was saying that how he they always talked about uh, you know in their in their glory years anyway they always were going to talk about you know have beers together and talk about the good old days and you know reliving everything and now they you know what do they have you know just their memories basically and uh, let's see and finally one last wrestler to mention as many <clears throat> as many wrestlers I could mention to you but we probably end up being here all day uh, Ricky the Dragon Steamboat. Well, I mean, that was a guy that, that really had it all. I guess he's working with WWE now as an agent. You wouldn't recognize him if you saw him. It looks like, looks like Judge Edo. It looks like Eric <laughs> Or Judge Edo. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Cause he's Japanese or half Japanese. But, uh, Ricky was a, I had some classic, classic matches of Ricky the Dragon Steamboat. Before he became the Dragon, he's just Ricky Steamboat. He came in to the Carolinas, and uh, he only had about six months of training, and uh, it looked like he'd been wrestling five or six years, and they teamed him up with Jay Youngblood, another guy that's passed on. They were a fantastic team that Flair and myself wrestled all the time. And um, uh, Steamboat's still doing good, and uh, he, he's got a son, a uh, big, tall, athletic-looking son of his who likes to... Uh, race the midget cars and stuff, and um, you know he's he's one of the best. Okay, and and even though I didn't add it to your list, I'm gonna add one more wrestler to your list, and and that of course uh, is Eddie Guerrero. Even though you probably never really had any matches with him, but maybe you have. I don't really remember. But no, uh, Eddie Guerrero um, was, you know, I know all the, I know Gory Guerrero, his yeah. grandfather, and Chavo, and and. Uh, and uh, who else? Um, uh, Hector, Hector Guerrero, yes. Mondo Guerrero. Chavo Guerrero called me up the other day, and we're doing a, uh, a big golf tournament in Tampa, Florida. Senior? Um, or uh, senior? senior, yeah. The one that's living out in Texas, Chavo, yeah. Or no, California is where he lives. But anyway, they're doing, they're doing a golf tournament in okay. Tampa coming up the end of October. And uh, I'm going to be there. I think Piper's going to be there, some other people. And uh, uh, it's to raise money for college fund for his kids. And uh, I know Eddie probably left left uh, his wife and his family uh, pretty well off because he was making lots of money and he was at the top of his game. And uh, but it, it's it's just a it's a good thing to to help him out and. Uh, um, uh, he was he had a great career going for him. I didn't know him that well, uh, but I certainly knew the family well, and I knew all those other guys well. What was your reaction when he found out you passed, or when he when he when you found out that he passed away? I just said, not another one. That's what I said, not another one. You know, that was a total shock. Kind of happened uh, a year prior to the uh, 2004 Survivor Series, kind of, because <clears throat> I remember. They're going to have Eddie Guerrero be because uh, he won his match against Ken Kennedy uh, back in November. They were going to have him be a part of the uh, Survivor Series uh, team for SmackDown or whatnot. So, okay, well that's about wraps up the uh, long 45 or what over 50 minute interview, which is really cool. I want to thank you for doing this interview first of all, and this is my first ever interview that I've ever done on the air, and I want to thank you for being. The guy to kind of kick everything off and whatnot, my new interview series. With, and and as you ris or, or radio people know, or people that listen to Pioneer 90 know, that uh, Glenn Brockett does the radio, the interviews uh, with singers and whatnot. He, he you know, calls up singers and whatnot and does interviews with them over the phone. But me, I, and hats off to him, but me, I'm more of the type of guy that just likes to. I, I thought about it. I said I want to do some changes on my show. Uh, I want to get people interested, take me more seriously than I think that they do take me. And just, you know, just uh, do interviews with people like celebrities like uh, Greg the Hammer Valentine. I'm still trying to wrap up, uh, do an interview with uh, Ned Beatty, who uh, is Santa Carlson right now. And, uh, and of course, then, uh, the guy by the name of Michael Strider, who is a rock and roll photographer. I'm sure, Greg, I'm sure you know who he is, maybe. I know he's good friends with Jimmy Valentine, anyway. Uh, and, uh, of course, uh, another guy I'm trying to get to will be, uh, I'm trying, I, I don't have him for sure, but trying, a guy by the name of Michael Perret, he's the guy, if you remember, maybe you remember, Greg, uh, the guy who played Eddie Wilson in uh, Eddie and the Cruisers. Oh, one of my 
favorite movies. Yeah, yeah. any of the yeah, cruisers? Definitely. I don't know. What was your favorite? One or two? Because they they made two of them. Well, the, you the, probably remember the, the first one. No, well, I I watched both of them, okay. and my wife is a big fan of both of those. But my the first one was my favorite because yeah. it had all the good music to yeah, it. Yeah. Uh, and it was in black and white, I think. And and uh, uh, yeah, and the, and the second, the second one. Um, in fact, I bought the second one. I I've had, I'm trying to find the first one on DVD, but I bought the second one, and uh, I enjoyed that one too. They filmed that up in Montreal, yeah. and um, it was it was a good good. But the first one was my favorite, yeah. and the music. Which was originally, uh, I, John yeah, Carole. John Cafferty, that fantastic music, kind of like uh, old Bruce Springsteen music, yeah. you know. So it's very, very, very good. Kind of reminds you for a bit. Well, even though it was uh, made up. If you do an interview with him, tell him Greg Graham Valentine's a big fan of his. And that, I, I will definitely yeah. do that. Uh, and uh, with his music, uh, or I mean, with the movie, what they try to do is, with that, it's actually a non. It's not a true story. It's it's just based on this fiction, you know. But uh, it kind of reminds me of like yeah, it kind of reminds you of like uh, the Buddy Holly story, kind of or La Bamba or whatnot. Good flick. Okay, and uh, so that's something I'm, I'm trying to do. Uh, let's see what else. And I said, well, I just want to thank you, say it's been a thrill to finally meet you and get a chance to meet a wrestling idol. It's me that you've been always, and I just want to say to all you listening out there, if you get a chance to. To, to hear, or you can hear this interview not only on Pioneer Night Point One FM, to what you're hearing right now, but uh, you can hear the encore and this uh, the following Tuesday next week. Uh, if you go online www.pioneer90.org, which is our website, and click listen online. And for those who of you who have missed this interview, there will be a special replay next week, right here on the Frankie Sloss Show. Thank you, Greg, and uh, continue success in the future. And I hope things work out for you. All right, thanks. Uh, it's uh, it's great. Uh, uh, you know, I, I I'm glad I'm I'm in, I'm your inauguration on this uh, your inaugural here uh, interview. So I uh, just want to say hi to all my fans and uh, keep on trucking. And if you could, one last thing, because uh, I know Glenn, you know, he has uh, a lot of singers, you know, kind of kind of give like a, a station ID kind of like like you're listening to Glenn Brock and on basement rock or whatever could you do like a like say I don't know you listen to or this is Greg the Hammer Valentine WWE Hall of Famer you listen to Frankie Slauson on the Frankie Slauson show on Pioneer 90.1 something like that yeah this is Greg the Hammer Valentine WWE Hall of Famer you're listening to the Frankie Slauson show, Frankie show on Pioneer 90.1. Thank you very much.